We have been told that certain people are experimenting with time. People from the not too distant past or the not too distant future. Am I right? That's right, yes. And consequently, as nobody should mess around with time. Except us. Except us. That these people are in danger. <laughs> sort of mainstream television, primetime television, as if it was a soap or something, or as if it, these days it was reality TV. It was a, there was a big hype on it, you know, it was going to be a big thing. Transuranic heavy elements may not be used where there is light. Medium atomic weights are available. Gold, lead, copper, jet, diamond, radium, sapphire, silver and steel. Sapphire and steel have been assigned. Sapphire and Steel were two totally fictitious characters. Uh, one in a grey suit, Steel, and one in a blue dress, Sapphire. And that's about as much as we know about them. They are difficult to explain, and I'm still asked questions about who they are, and I don't know. It was great because it never explained who they were. We didn't need to know who they were, but they'd come along to do something. Of course, we did know who they were. He was the man from UNCLE, she was a new Avenger. Same hairstyle, different lengths. But once they became spooky time detectives on primetime TV, confusion reigned. Scary no-face photographs, phantom railway stations, and the tormented screams of flying pillows and slaughtered swans. These time crimes were solved with the occasional help of lumbering lead and cheeky posh ponce silver. The pure essence of the programme was just then puzzling over puzzles constantly. The puzzle of time. That, that, that was it, week in, week out. Find it, Sapphire. Find the darkness. Sapphire and Steel was this very dark and oppressive and claustrophobic show. I mean, the two heroes were fighting. They were fighting sort of concepts. They were fighting the concepts of loss and guilt and misery and pain. They were the real villains there. And this was sort of, you know, just after tea time. No. Hold up. It's a sci-fi detective story. I wanted to get away from the idea of people going back in time. So I thought a good idea would be to have a couple of detectives who are trying to deal with the situation of time breaking in. There is a corridor, and the corridor is time. It surrounds all things, and it passes through all things. So I, I don't doubt this idea of time being a fabric, and a fabric that's stretched, and in some places is probably threadbare. This corridor, can you enter it? No, not in the way you imagine. You cannot enter into time. But sometimes, time can try to enter into the present, break in, burst through and take things, take people. If that fabric of time was broken in some way, it was a disastrous situation for the Earth and for the whole of life on Earth. And whenever someone did something that possibly could reverse time or break that fabric, two um, agents were sent from some far-off place to come and correct the situation. In wigs and contact lenses. The attack has started. I think P.J. Hammond and Shauna Reardon didn't think of the forces that came back to break this fabric of time as malevolent, necessarily. I think they all had a good reason. That's why that whole one in the abattoir with the agony of the animals being killed, I mean, it, there's a justification there. Don't worry, no one got it. That was the point. Oh, the fact that you couldn't understand a word of what was going on in Sapphire and Steel was definitely the best thing about it. Absolutely riveting. Sometimes it's best not to know because you can just let your imagination go right. We decided we wanted to make it a bit of fun, as well as being a supernatural thriller, and we didn't want to um, explain too much. Now, not yet. Well, there it is. But how do we open it? It has no lock, no handle, remember? Steele was the intellectual, the logical planner, the leader, the general. Sapphire was a more feeling creature, sentient creature, who could, um, 
who could sort of tune in. No, the sun is shining. It's very bright. It's almost dazzling. They were just a very, very good foil for each other, and they were both very attractive looking in their own way. It was high quality nonsense. Yep, two blonde bombshells with all the time in the world, and the biggest question of all was he giving her one? What obviously everybody wanted, and why they'd probably given them the vast amounts of money, was that the whole idea was would they, wouldn't they? That it was a David Duchovny Julian thing, that it was like moonlighting with Bruce and Sybil. Would they or wouldn't they? Which side of the bed would you prefer? I don't know. That sort of begs the question, what do agents of that ilk get up to in their private moments? And I, the mind boggles. No spaceships, no ray guns, and no men in silver suits. It was about atmosphere, fear, and creaking stairs. As a child, growing up, watching Sapphire and Steel, it scared the living hell out of me. They don't make shows that scary anymore. They make them jokey, but you, you did not dare go to bed with the light off after Sapphire and Steel. Undead, undead, undead. The programme wasn't about giving answers and wasn't about any form of explanation of, of anything at all, uh, and therefore kept everything open-ended. Nothing was resolved, so that, that can be disturbing. It's certainly in, in British primetime television, everybody wants everything to be sorted out, end with a kiss, end with some form of happiness. This, this I believe, ended with them being adrift in, in space. Where they came from, who knows? Where, where they went when that brief series ended, no one knows. But um, I'd sure like to find out. It would be wonderful to do it all again, just to explain who the hell Sapphire and Steel really were. <laughs> <laughs>